in Spanish as well. And uh, in that case, we would be very happy to translate for Arthur. Uh, so yeah, uh, please Arthur, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you for, um, for the invitation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, exactly what Juan just mentioned, uh, string diagrams and C star algebras. And specifically my goal is to eventually talk about infinite dimensional C star algebras. But for the, a majority of the talk, I will talk about finite dimensional ones. And so before I even talk about the non-commutative setting, I want to illustrate the importance of categorical probability theory on its own. And the idea in this subject is that we're trying to formulate uh, many of the axioms, many of the ideas, theorems, definitions from the context of probability theory, information theory, um, information processing, uh, and we're trying to describe it in a categorical language. And the idea is that uh, we'd like to isolate the structures that are needed to rigorously define these ideas and specifically ones that don't involve necessarily measure theory. And because category theory is a theory of processes, uh, its axioms should be capable of handling a general theory of such information processing. And we'd like to discover definitions, theorems, and proofs that apply to all realizations, so all examples of you know, instances of these uh, different um, categorical contexts that uh, you know, may say something new about that specific context. So there are a lot of theorems, and today I'll mainly just be focusing on the first one, Bayes' theorem. Um, but there are a lot of other interesting theorems that you can think about, uh, many of which have been recently written about uh, in the literature specifically uh, Tobias Fritz and Paolo, I think is in the audience. Um, so, you know, they have, uh, they have a lot of work in this direction as well. And so here's the rough outline of my talk. I will first talk about Bayes' theorem for uh, just in the usual setting of finite sets and stochastic maps. And then I will use that to motivate the definition of a Markov category. And then we will generalize that to the finite dimensional non-commutative setting. And afterwards, we'll see essentially what, uh, what happens if you try to extend this even further to the infinite dimensional setting. So let me first uh, talk about this finite dimensional commutative setting. So in this case, we're just gonna look at finite sets and the morphisms in this category are going to be stochastic maps. So these go by many names uh, like stochastic matrices, transition kernels. Um, I'm just gonna call them stochastic maps. And what they do is they're generalizations of functions where instead of associating to each point uh, in the domain, a unique element in the codomain, you associate to each point in the domain, a probability measure. So I've drawn this sort of a, a cartoon on the right where it shows a point evolving to some spread. You know, you have a, it's, you can also think of this as a conditional probability given X what is the probability that Y happens? And that's what um, F subscript YX uh, denotes. And in the middle, you'll see a string diagram notation. And this is how I'll be drawing string diagrams and time is going to be oriented up or you know, maybe causality is going to be oriented in the upwards direction. And uh, what we can do is we can also draw string diagrams for composition. If you give me two stochastic maps or two conditional probabilities that match, we can take their composite uh, this is just in series composition. And what you're doing in terms of the probabilities is you are multiplying the corresponding probabilities and then summing up over all intermediate steps. And another one of the mathematical objects in this category of particular interest, like a special kind of a stochastic map where your input, your domain is actually a single element set and the data of such a stochastic map corresponds to a probability measure on the codomain. So I'm gonna denote that with a triangle. And the reason for this is because um, we think of this uh, an empty line, like if there's no uh, string coming out of it as the monoidal unit in the category. And it's a monoidal unit specifically for a product in this category where we take two stochastic maps and we just if we want to define the product, we just define it to be such that it's the product on the corresponding probabilities. And this gives us an in parallel composition. 
So you see here that we have some monoidal structure going on in such a category. And another interesting uh, structure that appears in finite sets and stochastic maps is the existence of a copy function. And this is just the stochastic map corresponding to the function that sends x to x comma x. So this is just the diagonal map. And I'm going to include it in our string diagrammatic calculus as a trident. So it has one input and two outputs. And with this, with this structure, we can actually make sense of one version of Bayes' theorem. And I'm going to call this uh, the Bayesian inversion form of Bayes' theorem. And the input data for this theorem is a probability measure on x and a stochastic map or a conditional probability from x to y. And the statement in the setting of stochastic maps is that there exists a map in the opposite direction such that this string diagrammatic equation holds. And if uh, we just set some notation, just so um, I have some terminology to work with, if I set this image probability measure under the um, composite of F and P, I'm gonna call that Q, and then the map G that's going in the opposite direction, that's the thing that's kind of like this inverse. Uh, well, I'm gonna call that the Bayesian inverse of that data. And this equation is just called the Bayes condition. So um, if we were to write out what that equation is on components, it would take this form. So we know that to specify the components, since we look at, if we look at each of these pictures, it's describing a map from the single element set to x cross y. So that means we're supposed to get a probability measure on y. And the statement is, is that these two different probability measures are equal. And if I were to write this in more traditional probabilistic notation, we would probably write this um, in the following way. And we would say something like, um, the, what this equality says, it's the probability of x given y times the probability of y equals the probability of, now you've reversed the variables, y given x times the probability of x. And that's uh, what the standard Bayes rule, um, it, that's the way the standard Bayes rule is usually written. Modulo may be dividing one of those terms out on both sides. And the purpose of this rule, if maybe this is the first time you're seeing it, um, it's used to make inference. For example, uh, diagnosing a disease based on symptoms. So if I think of um, X, the, like the set X is um, specifying some collection of potential diseases, and then Y is some collection of possible symptoms, then given a certain, um, then what we could do is our probability P could represent maybe the likelihood or the probability that a given individual has a specific disease, like if you look at an entire population. And then you can look at um, the map, the stochastic map from X to Y is saying, if you have a specific disease, what is the probability that you will show these kinds of symptoms? And then often the question that you're really interested in answering is if you know, somebody comes in into, your, um, you know, into the doctor's office and they have a specific set of symptoms, then the doctor should try to make an, oops, the doctor should try to make an inference um, given those symptoms, what is the most likely disease that that person has? And Bayes' rule, this, uh, this Bayes' rule is a way of actually telling you what is that most likely disease based on that information. But there's another version of Bayes' theorem uh, in terms of conditioning. And for this version, we uh, can use another structure that's available to us in this category which is the fact that um, the single element set is a terminal object. And so there's a canonical function mapping from every set into it. And so I'm gonna draw that as a grounding map in terms of the string diagrams. And with this structure, we can define things like marginal states. So if we have a joint distribution, a joint probability, we can take each of the marginals and that just corresponds to tracing out a subsystem. And with this structure, we can make sense of another version of Bayes' theorem, which has slightly different starting data. It says, if you give me a joint probability distribution, then I can find stochastic maps between X and Y and Y and X, such that this equality holds. And it looks a lot like the first one, and I'll mention about the relationship between the two in a moment. And these stochastic maps are called the conditional distributions. And if you have seen probability theory um, in a, you know, earlier at some point in your life, 
you will um, actually see that if you give me random variables, let's call them X and Y, but you know, if you give me random variables X and Y, you can construct things like the joint distribution, these conditional distributions, and this agrees with that notion. And if we write down what these equations are on elements, then they would take this form. So S subscript uh, X comma Y is just this joint distribution at the point X comma Y. And in more probabilistic uh, traditional notation, you could write this as in, in the following way. And although this looks exactly like the first version of Bayes' theorem, notice that the starting data are different. And this is very important from a categorical perspective because we want to differentiate uh, actually what is our input data, what is our output data. And in the first version, the initial data consisted of a probability on X and a stochastic map from X to Y. And in the second version, the initial datum is just a joint state. And there were two versions of this theorem and they're very closely related in this um, classical setting. And I won't be able to talk about it today, but um, it's, it's very important to realize this distinction. And actually in the quantum setting, um, you know, you could have different notions because of this different starting data. And it's actually quite subtle, uh, this distinction. But um, I won't be talking about that. Instead, what I want to do is I want to isolate the necessary structure, or at least a sufficient structure, to uh, state these two different versions of Bayes' theorem. And what we needed was a monoidal structure. So we needed these tensor products. We needed the notion of states. So we needed to have this uh, monoidal unit and um, you know, maps, maps like this. We needed a copy map. We also use the discard map to make sense of marginals. And we might even want other properties that maybe help us actually use the string diagrams to um, perform certain calculations uh, with ease. And this, well, this is one way to motivate the definition of a Markov category. At least this is the way I'm motivating it for the purposes of this talk. And here's the definition. I don't expect you, if this is the first time you're seeing it, to digest everything at once. Um, but just keep in mind that the primal example that I'm focusing on is the category of finite sets and stochastic maps. And this is a lot of the structure that that category has. And one thing that I do want to emphasize is um, this equality at the far right, which says if I take a copy and then I swap my two outputs, that's the same thing as just taking a copy of those two and not doing anything. This is, uh, I'm gonna call this like the commutativity axiom of a classical Markov category. Some of these other ones might also be familiar, like the one in the middle here is co-associativity, uh, the one on the left is unitality, and so on. And this bottom one here about unitality, feel free to ignore. Um, it just means uh, it's like an information preservation condition. And it says that for in this example of finite sets and stochastic maps, I could have also chosen to say, to every point, I associate a measure instead of just a probability measure. But the fact that it's a probability measure actually um, says that this equation holds. I'm sorry, Arthur, there's a question in the chat. Yes. So this is by Roberto. So he's asking uh, if this is the same as a commutative um, algebra object plus a state or something like. Co-commutative, -com co yeah. Co-commutative, yeah. Yeah. It's I'm pretty sure it's very similar to that, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So finite sets and stochastic maps are an example. Um, there are many other examples as well, but um, I rather, rather than focusing on the collection of classical examples, I want to head in a different direction. And I want to try to see uh, what about this definition um, sees non-commutative um, versions of this. And what I, I'm really interested in is, for example, finite dimensional, again, just finite dimensional for now, but C star algebras and positive unital maps. And why do I want to think of these? Well, there's actually a fully faithful functor from this finite um, set and stochastic map category into this category of finite dimensional C star algebras and positive unital maps. And what it does is it just sends a set X to the set of, to the algebra of functions on that set. And I don't need to tell you what it does on morphisms. Um, I'll, I'll give some special cases in a moment, but 
it essentially is a generalization of the pullback. So that's why there's an op there because it's a contravariant functor. And it's essentially surjective onto the subcategory of commutative C star algebras. So this really tells you that classical stochastic evolution dictated by stochastic matrices or stochastic maps um, is also equivalently described by evolution on the corresponding algebra of functions by positive unital maps. And um, maybe I should say what a positive unital map is. Maybe that's not totally familiar, but a positive unital map, if you have an algebra, you can make sense of positive um, elements, like if matrices, um, positive elements in that case are um, self-adjoint matrices whose spectrum is non-negative. So they have all positive eigenvalues or non-negative eigenvalues rather. So what are some of the properties of this uh, functor? Well, it takes a product of two sets to the tensor product of the corresponding algebras. It takes the unit to the unit, which in this case is the complex numbers itself. It takes a probability measure on X and it turns it into what's called a state, which is a functional on that algebra. Notice now that because we're in the opposite category, we're reading these diagrams from top to bottom. So here the input is an is a function, so an element in CX, and the output computes its expectation. So this, um, this duality is giving you um, the relationship between probabilities and the corresponding expectation value function. And if I started off with a stochastic map that happened to be a function, so it happened to give you Dirac delta measures, then that gets sent to a star homomorphism, which is a map that preserves the algebraic preserves all the algebraic structure, as well as the involution, which is just a complex conjugation on each point. The discard map, again, we're reading on the left from bottom to top, but on the right from top to bottom, uh, gives you a map from C into C of X. And because all of my C star algebras, I may not have said this, but they're all going to be unital. This means that there's always a unique map from C into any C star algebra which means that C is an initial object in this category. And what happens to the copy map? And this is the one I really wanna focus on. The copy map gets sent to the multiplication map. So if you give me two functions, I can multiply them and I get a new function. And that's exactly what corresponds to this. But if we were to look at what the multiplication map does on arbitrary algebras, it actually does not satisfy the commutativity axiom at all. Even worse, the multiplication map is not even positive for an arbitrary C star algebra. And the main reason is because the product of two positive matrices need not be positive. And the root of this stems from the fact that actually the product of self-adjoint matrices need not be self-adjoint. And this is a very standard uh, thing in quantum mechanics when you first learn about it, um, right? This is essentially, um, why, you know, if you take the product of two observables, it's not necessarily an observable. But um, there is something that sort of saves the situation in some sense. And the multiplication map does satisfy this other equality when you include the involution. So, right, if I'm, now let's try to read these diagrams. Unfortunately, I think I reversed this order. Let's focus on this one first. Um, imagine these two input strings on the right of this equality in the string diagram are A1 and A2. If you read this diagram from top to bottom, when you first hit that trident, um, which is you know, the dual of the copy map, I'm gonna multiply the two. So that's A1 times A2. And then I apply this involution, which is this little bubble. And that gives me what's on the left here. And I can't, unfortunately, I'm not sure if I'm highlighting the right. I have a few faces that block the view for me, but um, I should have highlighted the next term, which corresponds to the left side of that equality. And you can see that if you start off with A1 and A2, I follow down and you swap. So now it's A2, A1. Then you take the um, complex conjugate of each, you take the adjoint of each, and then you multiply the two, and that's what's the output on the right. So this is what the multiplication law satisfies in the context of C star algebras. And, and this I, I just mentioned where the little empty bullet is a, um, the involution on that algebra. And the last axiom looks a lot like the commutativity axiom, so you might wonder if it can be used as a suitable replacement. And uh, it turns out you can. So you can make sense of this, but we do have to be a little bit careful 
And the reason we have to be careful is because the involution is not exactly a linear map. It's what's called a conjugate linear map, or also known as an anti-linear map. And this means that um, you just have to sort of enlarge the category. Like, you know, you started off with, you wanted positive maps, and then you realize oh, I can't have positive maps because of the multiplication map. Multiplication map is linear. Then you're like, okay, I'm gonna enlarge my category even more. But now you have to include the involution. So you keep enlarging your category even more. And now you're going to include linear and conjugate linear maps. If you do that, that forms what's called a Z2 graded symmetric Minoto category. And this Z2 grading just means that your morphisms are either going to be linear or conjugate linear. And you have to be careful with the Z2 grading because although you can compose any morphisms in any way you want, in fact, this Z2 grading tells you things like, um, you know, if you compose linear with linear, it's linear, conjugate linear with conjugate linear, it's, it's, a, it's linear. And if you compose either of the, um, if you compose two different ones, then it's going to be conjugate linear. But you can't take the tensor product. And uh, in fact, it, this uh, Z2 graded symmetric monoidal category is not a monoidal category because you can only take the tensor product of things that have the same degree. So let's look at our example just to get a better understanding of this, um, which are finite dimensional C-star algebras. So the morphisms are either linear or conjugate linear. The copy map is exactly what we mentioned before. The discard map is, doesn't change at all. The involution is what we had just described. And the tensor product structure tells you that you can take linear with linear, conjugate linear with conjugate linear, but um, you can't necessarily take the tensor product of a linear and a conjugate linear map and uh, there's like a very simple argument to explain why. I mean, it's just a calculation, but um, you can try to take the tensor product of linear and conjugate linear maps, and you'll see that it's not well-defined um, as a tensor product over C. So although the category of finite dimensional C-star algebras and positive unital maps is not a quantum Markov category, and again, we wanted to focus on positive unital maps because those are the things that correspond to um, evolution in quantum systems, at least in some weak sense, because po positive unital maps are essentially the things that take density matrices to density matrices or states to states. So that's like the minimal we require for, um, you know, for some kind of an evolution. But very often, uh, physicists often consider completely positive maps, which is even stronger condition. And, but the point is, neither of them uh, make sense as quantum Markov categories, but Here's the important point, they embed inside of one. And when you embed inside of one, you can actually use the string diagrammatic techniques inside of that larger context and then apply it inside the one that um, you might care about as like a subcategory of um, actual physical processes. So because this category is a quantum Markov category, um, I just realized I didn't explain this notation. It's maybe a little bit comical. Um, this is the yin-yang symbol, um, and the, uh, the yin is the linear part, and the yang is the anti-linear part. <laughs> so the, the usage of this uh, notation is just to indicate, uh, in order for this to make sense, you have to have both. <laughs> um, so, right, so what are the things we can do? Well, we can try to transfer definitions that we've given, for example, this uh, notion of Bayesian inversion to the finite dimensional non-commutative setting. Uh, we can try to provide abstract proofs of theorems from statistics that are also valid in the non-commutative setting, but we have to be careful because we have this modified commutativity axiom. And uh, we can hope to find new results or ideas beyond those obtained by, for instance, older methods, uh, you know, when you know, non-commutative probability was being built in its first form, which is a purely algebraic uh, expression. But it's potentially possible that, uh, or conceivable that some of the ideas that category theory has to offer may um, provide new results or new insight into those of, um, that, we've kn that we know all already. And in fact, much work is being done in this direction. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit selfish and I'll probably list uh, mainly things that I've been working on. Um, so uh, there are necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of Bayesian inverses. Um, we actually know what, uh, what the conditions are. Um, and it's actually non-trivial. Um, and uh, it involves a lot of interesting linear algebra in the finite dimensional setting. And it involves also like 
cool um, matrix completion problems, like positive matrix completion problems. And uh, there are also many of the axioms, um, and I, I believe uh, Tobias Fritz mentioned this in the last semester in your, in your seminar, um, that there are also many interesting axioms that you can assume on a classical Markov category. And those axioms can be used to then prove important theorems and statistics. So um, actually the non-commutative setting, uh, a lot of in important uh, physically, like physically important subcategories of finite dimensional C star algebras and these unital and conjugate linear maps, um, they also satisfy these axioms too in this more general setting. And so you could wonder if um, those resulting theorems are true and many of them actually are uh, because many of the proofs still go through whether or not you need um, that commutativity axiom, but some of them don't. So you do have to be a little bit careful about checking them. And uh, also in a different direction in the sense of the second version of Bayes theorem I mentioned, um, work has also begun on supplying necessary and sufficient conditions um, for the existence of conditionals from this point of view um, in the setting of um, matrix algebras. So, okay, that was a lot about the finite dimensional setting. For the rest of this talk, I really wanna focus on the infinite dimensional setting and what can be said about that. And one of the most important um, structures that we need to make sense of this, or that it seems that we need to make sense of this is the idea of a tensor product. And if we're talking about arbitrary C star algebras, then we know that there are many tensor products on, um, on that category, but you have to actually be specific about which category you're working with. So let's first focus on star homomorphisms. Um, there are many C star norms on that category. And, um, but we don't necessarily want to isolate star homomorphisms because those correspond to deterministic maps. So let's try to generalize that a little bit more. Let's try to see um, if, we, if we wanted to do, for instance, completely positive maps. So they have all, that's, that, subcategory, that subcategory of like, let's say all C star algebras and I don't know, bounded linear maps or something like that um, has additional um, structure. And there are actually also many C star norms that give you a monodal structure on that category as well. By the way, a C star norm is just, um, uh, if, you, if you were to take two C star algebras and you took their algebraic tensor product, then the algebraic tensor product could have many different norms on it for which that algebraic tensor product becomes a C star algebra upon completion with respect to that norm. So that's what I mean by a C star norm. I don't need its precise definition for the purposes of this talk, just the fact that there are many different norms available on the tensor product of two C star algebras. And, but we also know that we need more than just completely positive unital maps because we need, um, for instance, this copy map, um, which is not completely positive and unital. And this is closely related to the no cloning theorem or also known as the no broadcasting theorem is a probably better analogy. So, maybe let's look at not necessarily positivity. Let's just look at bounded linear maps. Now bounded linear maps is not good enough either because just like you can, you can take the tensor product of two positive maps and not get a positive map. Um, but if, if you, and so if you take the tensor product of two bounded linear maps, you might not get a bounded linear map with respect to these C star norms either. So we generally consider completely bounded. And this just means that you can really take the tensor product of these um, these maps. So we also have many C star norms there. So this uh, is just a lot. Does yeah. Does here just mean something sort of like um, uh, compact or a compact operators or is it, uh, does it mean something different? Um, I think I missed the first part of your question. Uh, sorry. So uh, completely bounded linear maps. Is that the same thing as compact operators? Um, not, I mean, I'm not necessarily. Um, so completely bounded means, um, it, yeah, so if I, if I have two C star algebras and I take a bounded map from one to the other, so C star algebras have a norm too, 
So if I take a bounded map, let's say with respect to that norm, and then I take another pair and I take their tensor product, um, that resulting tensor product, I have to actually be more specific about um, how it's defined. I can define it algebraically, but then I have to ask, is it continuous with respect to the new norms that I've placed on those tensor products? And in general, it's not. So um, only, only those that are, are, are called completely bounded satisfy that property. In right. fact, so my question basically was, what does completely bounded mean? Yeah. Ah, okay, so um, the, the, the rigorous definition is if you have a map from, let's say, a C star algebra A to B, then that map is completely bounded if you take the tensor product of that map with the identity map on any finite dimensional matrix algebra, then that map is also bounded. So it's actually, this is actually a little bit subtle because if you take a C star algebra A and then you take the tensor product of it with let's say two by two matrices, then that gives you a new algebra and you can also put many norms on that too, many C star norms, but it turns out that all of them are equivalent. So this has to do with the fact that, you know, um, M2 is uh, two by two matrices uh, uh, form what are called a, a nuclear C star algebra. So there's always a canonical um, C star tensor product. So you don't have to think about which one you choose, you, you pick one. And then if you take the tensor product with the identity, if that's also bounded for all dimensions for the matrix algebras, then you have a completely bounded map. So it's, it's very similar to completely positive, which instead of asking for boundedness, you ask for positivity. Um, and in fact, completely positive maps are completely bounded. So if, if I go down in this list in this paragraph, we're trying, we're sort of like looking at bigger and bigger categ categories. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thanks for the question. Um, so based on this uh, progression, and you know, we finally ended up with these completely bounded linear maps as we're hoping are like maybe a good enough structure. Um, is there a quantum Markov category of C star algebras and these completely bounded linear maps? Oops. And uh, the answer is uh, no. <laughs> so um, sorry for the suspense. And uh, this stems from the fact that um, there, uh, the lack of a completely bounded linear um, multiplication map, which is the one we really need. We really need this copy map to make sense of most of the axioms. So uh, the main issue is that there is no C star norm such that the bounded multiplication map on the product, right? So this is just the usual um, product or direct sum or something on every C star algebra induces a bounded linear map on the corresponding tensor product. Now, if you're, you know, if, if um, from just, just from linear algebra, if, um, if these were uh, finite dimensional uh, matrices, then you would know if you took the, if you took a bilinear map, then you know by the universal property of the algebraic tensor product, there's a corresponding linear map on the tensor product that, you know, essentially in some sense agrees with um, that bilinear multiplication map and agrees with in that sense is just this equation essentially. But um, this need not happen for C star algebras. It does for star homomorphisms. If you look at uh, the, so the first category I mentioned, there does exist a C star norm for which um, the tensor product does satisfy a universal property like this. But when we remove ourselves from this deterministic category and we try to generalize it so that we can include these ideas from statistics in the non-commutative setting, um, this, this in general does not happen. So I actually wanna illustrate that point in more detail. So what we're going to do is we're going to compute these norms and it might sound a little bit hard, but I promise you most of this is just um, basic linear algebra as you'll see. So uh, we're gonna argue why there's no C star norm for which the linear multiplication map is bounded for um, let's say B of H where H is a finite, uh, infinite dimensional separable Hilbert space. But before we go to the infinite dimensional setting, we will focus on just n by n matrices. So we'll let uh, mn denote the bilinear multiplication map. 
and mu n denote the associated linear map, which we know exists because we're in the finite dimensional setting um, on the corresponding uh, matrix algebra. So again, all we're doing is we're working with n by n matrices now, or n squared by n squared matrices if you take the tensor product. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that the first bilinear multiplication map has norm less than or equal to 1, and the associated linear map has norm greater than or equal to n. And then after we do that, then we'll go back to the infinite dimensional setting and see what, and see what that says about that case. So let's look at first the multiplication map um, as a bilinear map on n by n matrices. So one of the basic Banach algebra axioms states that the norm of the product is less than or equal to the product of the norms for any element. And uh, another thing that I uh, want to recall is that the norm on the, again, the product, so this is not the tensor product, just the product, um, is given by the soup norm. Um, and if this sounds a little bit strange to you, just think of um, A1 and A2 as being, um, you know, algebras of functions, then what we do is we, uh, when, we, when we take the product, we just take the, um, that's like essentially the direct sum. And what we do is we take the soup norm. So um, let's look at all elements of unit length in the domain of this function. So again, the domain is this product. So we're going to look at an element um, on the unit sphere. And if we do that, then we know that um, because this definition is the soup of these two um, um, operators, these two matrices, then if we take the product of these by the Banach algebra axiom, this first inequality holds. But because the soup of these two elements is equal to one by assumption, each of these on their own are less than or equal to one as well in norm. So that's why this second equality, inequality holds. But that's exactly what um, the norm uh, on the codomain is. So this automatically tells us that um, the norm, the operator norm of this map is less than or equal to one. So here I've just drawn a little cartoon. Maybe I should have shown this earlier about what's happening. We take something on the unit sphere, look at its image, and then we try to um, find out what is the um, largest norm if we map out along this unit sphere? So that was for the um, bilinear multiplication map. If we try to extend this map to the tensor product, uh, what we'll do now is we'll look at, um, we'll still look at that unit sphere, but I'm going to try to construct an element on this unit sphere in the domain now of the tensor product whose image has norm that equals n. So how will we do that? Well, let's just recall um, some notation. If I denote the ij matrix unit, so this is the matrix which has zeros everywhere except for one in the ij component. And then what we'll do is we'll define a new matrix on the tensor product. And I'm just going to put my matrix units together in this way. And I've also drawn what the actual matrix looks like in the tensor product. Um, if the matrix notation is a little bit more familiar to you, um, this is now an, this entire matrix on the right is an n squared by n squared matrix. Um, so each of these actual um, blocks here, it's hard to highlight, um, is a n by n matrix. So it's an n by n matrix of n by n matrices. And you'll notice that all of these um, potentially non-zero matrices are on the top. And if I actually compute the norm of this matrix, and the way you compute the norm is you take that matrix, you take its complex conjugate, you multiply the two, and when you multiply the two, you'll get a diagonal matrix. And this diagonal matrix has only ones and zeros along its diagonal. Once you write the computation, I didn't want to actually compute this here for you, but you'll find that you have just ones and zeros along the diagonal. And so its norm is one. But if we look at what happens when we take the product of these two matrices by applying this uh, linear map, um, when we take the product of two matrix units and the second index of the first matrix unit 
matches the first index of the matrix unit, then you just um, drop the I in the middle and you get um, E11. This is something, if you haven't seen before, you can just sit down and compute it for yourself. Um, but um, that's one of the properties of the matrix units. And then you'll notice that there's no longer any I dependence on this matrix. And so you're just having N copies of this um, matrix. And when I, you know, when, when you finish this computation, you just get an N by N matrix with N in the top left corner and zero everywhere else. And the norm of that is just N. So the norm of this map is at least N because we found an element whose norm gets, goes from one to, to N. So that's all in the finite dimensional setting. And you can imagine if I'm taking n to infinity, if I think of my infinite dimensional separable Hilbert space as sort of like infinite by infinite matrices, then you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Um, and we're gonna show that this um, uh, map has an operator norm, which is infinite. But before we get there, we have to be careful a little, a little bit about um, the different C star norms and we want to make sure that we cover all the possibilities at the same time. So if you give me a C star algebra, this is just a little picture for the different kinds of C star norms that are allowed on C star algebras. And it turns out that they have this uh, interesting property where there's always a largest norm that you can put on any ten algebraic tensor product. And there's also a smallest one. And then all other norms always sit in between the two. And again, I mentioned that there could be at least one. And in fact, there generally are um, more than one C star tensor norms for arbitrary C star algebras. Sometimes they all coincide, but in general, they're different. And there's one fact that I will use, which I'm going to think of as a black box. Um, I don't think this theorem from what I remember is too difficult to prove actually, but um, I'm just going to assume it rather than prove it. And it's that if you give me any C star algebra, then there's an interesting relationship between its norm being bounded by one. Um, and if I construct a two by two matrix involving that element A, and if that matrix is positive, in this uh, two by two um, matrices with entries in A. So let's look at um, this fact that says multiplication is not bounded on B of H. So if you give me an orthonormal basis, I can construct these matrix units by just, um, you know, if I, if I were to write this in direct broad, Bracket notation, maybe I'd write this as like EL on the left and then EK on the right. Um, and that would give me these um, matrix units. So we can define a sequence of operators as we did before. And we're going to define this as a sequence in the algebraic tensor product. And this is exactly the same sequence that we had defined earlier. So it's this uh, tensor product of these um, matrix units. And because it's a finite sum, uh, we know it's in the algebraic tensor product. And if we wanted to show that this norm is less than one, so to compute the operator norm, remember I wanna look at this unit sphere and I wanna see where it goes under this map. But by the previous limit, if I wanna show that this thing actually has norm less than one, I just have to prove that this matrix is positive. And in this case, we're going to look at the maximal C star norm because that's going to be the worst case scenario. If we know something is going to, if we know this example is going to work in the maximal C star norm, then we know it'll imply, um, if, sorry, let me rephrase that. If we start with an element in this unit sphere where the unit sphere is defined by the maximal C star norm, then if we use any other C star norm, it's going to be um, contained in that. So that's why it suffices to look at the maximal C star norm. But, uh, you know, not a very difficult calculation at all shows that this is positive because I can write it as a product, uh, as a square. And um, so that's what, that's what that is. And because of that fact, um, it has norm less than one for the maximal C star norm. And it has norm less than or equal to one for therefore all C star norms. 
So that means, so this is the first part of the argument. Um, we found a sequence of elements on the unit sphere um, that, uh, sorry, well, the calculation actually only proved that they're within the unit sphere. So, but we have a sequence within the unit sphere. And now what we wanna do is we wanna see what happens to that sequence on the unit sphere after we apply this multiplication map. But we already did this calculation before and we know that the image of that has norm n. Therefore, we have a sequence, we have an infinite sequence within the unit sphere and each element of the sequence gets sent to an operator whose norm is at least n. Therefore, the sequence um, tends to have infinite norm as we go through the sequence. Therefore, this map cannot be bounded. Is that argument kind of, <laughs> I hope it wasn't too complicated. I, I think that it has a very nice intuitive picture associated to it. Um, so this map cannot be continuous. And this is a problem because this means that the Markov category framework, at least in this point of view, cannot be extended to contain arbitrary C star algebras, just finite dimensional ones. And um, this is a little bit disconcerting because I'd like to know whether these categorical techniques can be applied in the infinite dimensional setting. And it actually seems, uh, if I don't think about the category theory for the moment, many of the proofs um, that go through don't use anything about finite dimensionality actually. Most of them only use things about the Caddis and Schwartz inequality. And in particular, um, the notion of Bayesian inversion was actually studied uh, about 40 years ago in this non-commutative setting um, by Accardi and Cecchini without necessarily the restriction of any dimensionality whatsoever. The only difference is that they assume that their states were faithful, which is just a, a, an assumption about what kind of states they're working with. But nevertheless, they did not make any assumptions about the finite dimensionality of their algebras. And yet the notion makes sense, the equation makes sense. And you would like to know, does this concept actually still make sense in the infinite dimensional setting using some categorical idea? So I, I expect um, to actually have an appropriate categorical framework that includes infinite dimensional quantum systems, finite dimensional ones, and the, all of the classical situations all at the same time. So one idea, and this is really the last part of the talk, it's gonna be now more of an open question, um, is that you can try to use multi-categories instead of monoidal categories. And the reason we might wanna do this is because, well, we noticed that the multilinear map corresponding to um, multiplication is actually bounded. It's bounded by one. So we would maybe try to consider instead of working with the tensor products, we start working with the associated bounded multilinear maps. And this means that we're working with uh, what's called a multi-category where you don't have um, a morph, you don't have necessarily a morphism from one object to another object. You have a morphism from a finite collection of objects to one object. And then you could draw the um, composition like this. Like if you, um, if you've ever seen um, operads before, this is a very similar picture from that setting as well. And um, so you might ask, well, if I'm working with uh, multi-categories, then I should also be able to draw the same string diagrams. And in fact, it seems like all of the definitions, if we just transfer them to the multi-category setting, everything seems to be transferable to the setting. And so we can even incorporate the involution in at least uh, one of two ways. Uh, one is for each C star algebra, you can actually look at the conjugate linear algebra, um, the conjugate C star algebra, which just uh, slightly modifies the multiplication by C so that you complex conjugate the, um, the action. Um, and then the involution can just be viewed as a linear map from the conjugate C star algebra to the original one or vice versa. That's one way. Um, that's not the way that I was talking about it earlier in the earlier part of this talk um, by including the involution as an anti-linear map. That's really the second point. Instead, you can maybe enlarge the multi-category to include uh, skew multilinear maps as well. So you have a collection um, and then you specify which ones are linear, which ones are conjugate linear. 
that's another option that you can do. So really the um, sort of the question is um, if you can actually uh, make sense of uh, such a quantum Markov multi-category. Um, and not only can you make sense of it as a rigorous mathematical definition, but is there actually a quantum Markov multi-category that includes infinite dimensional C star algebras as well? And uh, this is really the, um, what I think of as an interesting uh, question because we'd really, we really believe that a lot of the techniques and tools used to prove a lot of the theorems in the finite dimensional setting uh, very well uh, should be applicable in the infinite dimensional setting as well. So that's really um, sort of the open question that I wanted to end off with. And let me just briefly summarize. Uh, so the categorical approach to probability theory, I suspect it may provide actually new and interesting approach towards quantum probability and the general structure of information flow in quantum mechanics. And the key idea is this uh, functor I mentioned earlier that takes a conditional probability between spaces, a stochastic map, and it replaces it by a positive unital map on the corresponding algebras. And what you do is once you understand the concepts abstracted categorically, uh, you can apply them simultaneously in both the classical and the um, quantum setting. And maybe even other ones as well that I haven't thought of. Um, and in particular, it uh, seems to offer a new formulation of quantum Bayesian inversion that seems to be different from most other proposals that I'm aware of um, in the uh, physics literature, with the exception of the Accardi Cicchini um, discussion I mentioned earlier. Though many of the um, concepts that appear in the physics literature are special cases of this in some sense. And I didn't get a chance to talk about this point, but um, I do uh, try to bring back to it a couple of times. And, um, you know, but to extend this to the infinite dimensional setting, it seems as though we need to actually leave the setting of monoidal or even graded monoidal categories and instead use multi categories. Um, when talking about uh, generalizing Markov categories in such a way so that I, they also include quantum systems. And that's really what I want to end at. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. And if you want to look into the literature, here are some of the possible sources and then the references therein as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Arthur, for the great talk. Um, thank you. Yeah, are there any any questions or comments uh, for Arthur? Uh, yeah, if there is any questions, yeah, please just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you, by the way, for the for the talk. Uh, quite enjoyable. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, so when you were uh, defining, I think you call it a Bayesian inverse. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Back. Yeah. Way back to to like flight ten or something. Um, I mean, how? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get yeah maybe, right. Maybe this one. Yeah. 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 So so is. Like what's what's the relationship between um, having Bayesian inverses and say conjugation in the category? Um, you mean the involution? No, just just like say say a uh, um, <clears throat> um, like something something which is an analog of of say finding a conjugate by module. Um, that reverses uh, the monoidal structure, and it's also conjugate linear. I'm not sure. I mean, my, I guess my question is, if if sort of you can you can take the idea of having Bayesian in, in, inversion and assemble into a into maybe a an opposite monoidal functor or something like that. Oh, um, yeah, actually. So, um, what you can do is you can look at. Uh, 
apologies if I forget the name, I always get my co's confused, but um, you can look at the slice category of um, stochastic maps and probabilities on those spaces and probability preserving stochastic maps. And if you look at that category and then you do something a little bit more subtle, which is you mod out by almost everywhere equivalence, which has a string diagrammatic formulation, then in many examples and under suitable axioms, that category um, still satisfies a lot of these important axioms like monoidality and it, it, um, it could admit a contravariant functor that takes a morphism in your category and gives you a new morphism that reverses, that reverses the orientation um, and satisfies this um, equation. So there's actually a dagger functor on this category and that dagger functor is indeed um, given by this uh, Bayesian inversion. I mean, Bayesian inversion gives you an example of such a functor. So you can think of it as like, um, you know, a dagger functor on a suitable category associated to the Markov category that you start with, provided that it satisfies additional axioms, which are satisfied in this case, and which are also satisfied in the non-commutative case, when they exist, when Bayesian inverses exist. And, and, and if so is the case, uh, would that give you, I mean, would that translate to say particular properties about your probability spaces? Um, in the sense that there are Markov categories where you don't necessarily have Bayesian inverses, but when you do, sometimes they do say something about the situation. Yeah. It's, you don't always get them for free. Like if I, if I wasn't working with finite sets, but I was working with arbitrary measurable spaces, mm -hmm. or let's say compact Hausdorff spaces and um, stochastic maps between them in some appropriate sense, then you might not always get a Bayesian inverse within that same category. Like, like if I start off with a continuous transition kernel, a continuous probability transition kernel, it's Bayesian inverse might not be continuous. Um, it would at best be maybe Borel measurable or something. Um, that's a little bit subtle though. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I guess I guess I have a second question. Uh, uh -huh. if, I'm, if I'm not taking anyone's turn, I think this was around slide fifteen, um, yep. where where you mentioned that the category you were working on fails to 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 be monoidal. Um, I think you have this this uh, lack of compatibility between linear and contrary linear. Oh yes, um, yes. Maybe it's either this slide or the one before it, or maybe it is this one. Yeah, around that. So, so um, you mentioned that sort of you, you got around that problem by embedding the category. Um, I'm not sure if it was this yin yang category somewhere. Correct. Else. Yes, it is. Uh, um, could, could you maybe repeat some of the details that go into there and sort of what is the structure of that embedding? Is it just a fully faithful? Um, oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, exactly. So you do have a, a fully faithful embedding, depending on which category you're using. Um, oh, sorry not necessarily full. Um, for instance, if I take positive unital maps, that does embed into this larger context, but this larger context doesn't just contain positive maps, it also contains linear maps, things like the multiplication map. So it's not a full embedding, but it is, it is faithful. And that's really the important point. Like you might have new maps that are not necessarily corresponding to some physical process, and you start off with a category which does have um, some morphisms that correspond to physical processes, you may perform certain operations on that subcategory, such as Bayesian inversion. And the question is, is you might not land in that subcategory again. You might be in this larger one if you perform this procedure. But under certain cases, um, if you do perform this procedure, you actually land back in the one that you are interested in, the one you started with. And that's kind of what you um, care about in applications. Mm -hmm. Hi. Good so yeah, this, this fact that you have, um, you have to do this embedding um, is a little subtle aspect, uh, but it doesn't 
prevent you from being able to do anything, um, it's in some sense, it's kind of like a bonus. Um, it allows you to perform these string diagrams by including this involution and by um, just being careful about this tensor product. And is it is it something like just like horizontally enlarging your, your category to become a multi-tensor thing? Uh, like why not just do that? Um, if I understood what you just meant, that could be exactly what I was mentioning at the very end, which was um, maybe you can avoid, you can, you might even also be able to avoid this discussion by working with um, multi categories and then you're avoiding the tensor product completely. And then you just remember like which line, like which string um, is, uh, is conjugate linear and which string is linear. And uh, that's probably a very good way to avoid it. And the only reason I didn't present it that way is for historical and personal purposes only, <laughs> just based on how I um, figured this out. So if I had, if I had come across multi-categories first when thinking about this, maybe I would have avoided this problem to begin with. <laughs> I see. Well, thank you again. Thanks so I much. Uh, thank you. Um, Robert, I think Paolo has a, a question. Just, I think it's very, his volume was a bit low. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear uh, you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somehow my microphone is funny. Yeah. No, I wanted to ask, do you have any idea how it could work with multi-categories? Like how a mark of multi-category may look? Uh, I don't know what plays the role of the copy map or maybe how you can say that something is deterministic or something like that? Well, I mean, in some sense, um, in the con, I, like, I really, I mean, the string diagrams look the same, right? I mean, there's also a close, close relationship between multi-categories and monodal categories, but um, I actually don't know what that precise relationship is, like if they're adjoints or something like that, I don't know. But the point is, um, it would seem that as though if this were to work, um, you can't go back and forth and still get the same thing back. but. But the point is, um, in a multi-category, the copy map, um, well, I guess it would be a co, I don't know, a co-multi-category if you're thinking of the classical setting. It would be a map from a single object to the, that object with itself. It would just be a special morphism in that category, a specific one, just like, the, um, just like a morphism uh, in an ordinary monodal category from that object to itself tensor itself. So, um, I would just include that as the same data. Um, it would look different. It would be formulated differently. Instead of going from X to X cross X, it would go from X to X comma X in the multi-category. And then you could also specify the same axioms. And um, it seems to me like it would look almost exactly the same. I see, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, well, so in that direction, have you, what is the, um, what would the multi, well, what the, what would the C, finite C-star algebra, uh, the Markov category of uh, finite dimensional C-star algebras look like in the, in the multi-category setting? So, um, I mean, in that case, so let's suppose that this, um, Let's suppose that the, um, there's a multi-category of C star algebras and let's call them skew multi-linear bounded maps um, so that you know, we specify which string is linear or conjugate linear and let's assume that they're all bounded. Um, then um, in that case, then we would just have a subcategory where each of the objects are the finite dimensional ones. So it would be um, completely embedded in this larger category, uh, multi-category. Um, so it, in some sense, it may seem even more natural. And, uh, and you, you can also look at the commutative subcategory and then that should correspond to um, compact Hausdorff spaces and stochastic maps between them. And if you're working in finite dimensional ones, then they should correspond to the finite sets and stochastic maps. 
So I do think, it, so if um, it actually does work, I just haven't thought about it enough, um, but if it does work, then all of those should be viewed as subcategories. Sub the ones that I mentioned, not all Markov categories would be view, viewed as a subcategory of this one. When I say category, I mean multi-category, but um, at least the ones that I mentioned. So compact house door spaces, finite dimensional C star algebras, and um, finite sets and stochastic maps. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, so, well, it seems like, uh, so in the first option that you gave uh, for implementing the involution, yeah, the category uh, setting, it seems like you wouldn't need um, the uh, Z2 gradient, would you? Would yeah. You okay. Yeah, it's, it's probably, a, yeah, it might be a better way of doing it. Um, okay. then, then you'd have like some, you know, involutive objects in your category. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so, I'm sorry. Another question. <laughs> so in the so you so in the in quantum uh, Markov categories, you in the you assume that the uh, copy map and delete maps are even, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you take just uh, the category subcategory of even morphisms, is that a classic classical uh, Markov category? Yeah. Good. Uh, good question. Um... So it's in general not, actually. And the only, but the only reason it's not is because it doesn't satisfy that commutativity axiom. That's like the only thing that fails. Otherwise, every other axiom holds. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's really, it's really um, that community. And, and um, if, you, if you try to actually you know, prove a lot of these theorems um, in this categorical framework, they almost always use, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't say almost always, but they often use um, the swap map so that you can move strings over, separate stuff and pull things around. But in, the, in this quantum setting, um, you have to keep track of this involution. And sometimes that restricts how okay. um, easily you can move stuff around. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, well, I guess one final question. Maybe this is uh, very stupid, but uh, why not? So in the infinite dimensional case, why not consider uh, von Neumann algebras instead of C-star algebras? Oh yeah, no, that's not a stupid question. I was thinking about that too. And, um, uh, but that's okay, yeah. So actually for, for von Neumann algebras, the situation seems worse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is because of um, the topology you're using. And in that case, um, at best, you can hope for um, continuity of the tensor product in a single variable, but it's like impossible to assume continuity in both variables. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's an even worse situation for some weird reason. I actually don't, um, yeah. I also find that a little bit concerning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but I think well, I think it's it's it seems also related to um, I think an open question of of Tobias, which is um, you know is there a suitable classical Markov category of um, of uh, certain commutative von Neumann algebras and um, positive unital maps between them? I think I think as far as I recall, um, that's kind of an open question. Okay. Yeah, I guess the multi-category setting in that case would sort of circle around. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, are, there, are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, I want to in, insist on this question of the copy map and multi-category setting. The yes. things I'm used to calling multi-categories have morphisms that go from uh, multiple objects to a single object. Yes. And the copy map goes the other way. It goes from one object to a pair of them. Correct. So it doesn't sound like something that fits in multi category. Co correct, correct. Um, yeah, so actually this is also related to, um, I think I was answering Paolo's question and this came up. And um, we're, yeah, this is happening because of this opposite flip. 
So I think I called it a copy map throughout the entire talk. But when we went to the algebra side, I should have called it um, something else, like maybe multiplication map, because that's what it corresponds right. to. And then we really are in the setting of multi-categories where you have many to one. Right. But um, Okay, right. But, so, so then it, you wouldn't have Markov multi-categories, but sort of Markov co-multi-categories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. You expect a definition of a Markov multi-category because it doesn't have the right shape for the copy map. Um, the, the objects wouldn't, sorry, the, the Markov things wouldn't be multi-categories, but co-multi-categories. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, exactly. good. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, let me <laughs> enter as well. I, I, uh, so first of all, uh, apologies uh, for I, I wasn't able to uh, to see most of your talk, unfortunately, only the the, the last piece. So uh, anything I say might be completely off and <laughs> no problem. a lot of things. But uh, anyway, I, I waited for the others to ask the more sensible questions. So maybe uh, you can excuse me. Um, so, so one kind of yeah, question about the setting I, I have, or, or one, I don't know if, if one already told you a bit about what we are doing, um, but uh, so one setting that we're interested in is where, uh, so where you wouldn't have C star algebras, but you would have uh, uh, only partially ordered vector spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically, you, you wouldn't have a multiplication, but you would still have a notion of positivity. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, the motivation of this, well, it's, it's a bit complicated. It has to do, uh, well, as, as various motivations. Uh, one is that in, in the context that we are working, um, the, the, the application to, to physics and to quantum field theory that we are interested in, the, the Mm. the multiplicative structure doesn't really carry uh, direct physical information. And so, so it's, it's not necessary on the one hand. On the other hand, it's in fact, it's a hindrance when you want to go to a setting which is not uh, based in a, in, in, <clears throat> um, in a framework where you think like in dynamical systems where you have a time evolution that's fixed. And you think of your processes as something that happens in time that sequentially. So when you want to go away from this, also this uh, product structure disappears in a sense. And then it turns out that you, you didn't need it in the beginning, uh, in, in at least to some extent. Um, there, there's another, so, so my question would be, do you think that what, what you are doing could in some way be generalized in this direction? And uh, related to that question, um, so, so there's also, yeah, unfortunately, I, I didn't uh, join your talk in time to see uh, where the problems with infinite dimensional stage of us exactly originated. But uh, some problems uh, of infinite dimensions can be um, ameliorated, let's say, in, um, in, in, in the setting that I'm talking about, because you can then use, make, uh, make use of positivity um, to allow uh, certain maps, for example, with, with real values to have, to have uh, infinite values, right? like uh, measure theory. Um, so, okay, so this is basically my question. I'm not sure it makes much sense since uh, unfortunately I, I couldn't see most of the talk. But. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, it's, it's actually, it would, yeah, it would be a little bit difficult for me to answer that completely, but um, I will make one comment, which is, um, so first of all, I don't know how to get rid of the multiplication map, but um, there are many axioms that you can impose on a Markov category or a quantum Markov category. And Tobias has often called a lot of these axioms, he's given them the name of positivity. And 
Um, and the reason has to do with um, the fact that in many of the examples that show up, the corresponding, um, you, so transition kernels are also examples of Markov categories and they don't have to give necessarily positive uh, information, but subcategories that satisfy this, um, these axioms often give this positivity constraint for free, but they are usually formulated in terms of a multiplication map. And, um, and I found out that the same is true in the non-commutative setting too, provided that um, they satisfy what's called the um, cadison schwartz inequality. So I don't know if you're familiar with that inequality. It's, um, it's essentially uh, an inequality um, on positive maps or maybe even arbitrary linear maps between, um, well, in this case, it, they, they, they are C star algebras. And um, it's kind of like a, a generalized um, Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And that does give you a notion of positivity for free. So, you know, I, it, again, I'm not really answering the question, but um, you asking it makes me think of that situation, which is kind of interesting if um, this categorical structure seems to see that positivity um, just by using the multiplication map. You're kind of looking at it from the opposite point of view, which is, you know, I'm trying to get rid of this multiplication and still seeing the positivity but um, I'm not sure how to see it from this point of view. So yeah, yeah, unfortunately that's all I can really say. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, anyway, I will, uh, I will uh, view the, your talk uh, completely uh, and, and then if I have more questions. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually looking at it. Usually I get warned if it's being recorded, but I don't see anything unless if it was stopped, unless the recording had stopped and I missed it. But. Is it possible that this wasn't actually recorded? When was it recorded? Ah, oh, no, is yeah, it's streamed. This is live yeah, streamed. Right. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, cool, okay. <laughs> so YouTube keeps the recording. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Rod. And uh, well, are, are there any other um, questions or comments? Uh, well, if not, let's uh, thank Arthur for the great talk. It was pretty nice having you here. Thank you.